will put my eyeballs in thy bulky brow. And ring these fingers with thy and ring these fingers with thy household worms. And stop this gap of rectifying some dust. shake the world and rouse from sleep that fell anatomy which cannot hear a lady's feeble voice which scorns a modern invocation. Well, it's time. I think I'll start now. <laughs> I see I'll have to introduce myself. I I'm so glad you've come here tonight. <laughs> I do hope you enjoy this. I, I hope you find something here that's interesting, thought-provoking, perhaps even challenging. <laughs> you might like to take notes. I see they've put out note paper for you. Shouldn't there be somebody here to introduce me? Maybe not. Maybe I'll just do it myself. Oh, I already did, didn't I? Oh, I just caught the echo of it back there behind my ears somewhere. Right, well, this is the, uh, the final lecture in the New Renaissance series. And the theme of tonight's lecture is the voice of Shakespeare. Now, let me be quite clear. From the start, when I say voice, I mean the sound that we humans make in order to express ourselves and communicate with each other. Each and every voice is quite unique because as the Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero has pointed out, so I love saying that, has pointed <laughs> out so beautifully, each and every one of us is quite unique. We are all individual, unrepeatable, exceptional, irreplaceable. Yes. The human voice is just as distinctive as a fingerprint, perhaps even more so. No two exactly the same. The human voice is, in fact, the sound of the human self. My voice is me, audible. Whatever I am thinking or feeling, you can, if you listen, hear me, my self. Nay, there is some comfort in the news, some comfort. Did anyone have a question? It, it is all right to ask questions. I promise I don't bite if you ask questions. Maybe later. Where was I? Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Of course, we do try to conceal ourselves from each other. Well, life would be pretty unpleasant if we went about being brutally honest all the time, exposing our true selves. That's why we have Shakespeare. <laughs> but I, I am getting a little ahead of myself now. Uh, for now, let me just say this. We cannot transcend the self. In theatre, though, we can use our voices to go some way towards a realisation I am not mad. <laughs> this hair I tear is mine. My name is Constance. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. He's not really lost, and 
his name is not really Arthur, and this is not really me. I'm not, I'm not normally like this. I have late, wherefore I know not, lost all my mouth, forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air. Look you. I am not mad. I, this hair up here is mine. My name is Constance. I'm Jeffrey's wife. And Arthur is my son. And he is lost. I'm not mad. I would to heaven I were. Look you. This brave, or hanging firmament. This majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it appears nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. Well, I guess you've heard it all before, hmm? Madness, depression, what's it all about? All these words, it's, it's not about meaning, is it? Meaning is inherently unstable, according to Derrida and many others. No, it's, it's all in the context, really, isn't it? I mean, suppose you thought that this was a castle in Denmark, and I was of royal blood, and a guy, well then you might be tempted to think that my mental instability had something to do with the fact that my mother had married my uncle, who'd murdered my father, whose ghost was haunting me, but it still wouldn't explain the missing child, would it? Or the hair tearing routine. No, 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 it's, it's a complex problem, isn't it? Words, words, words. How do they do that? How do they do that thing where you take them out of one context and put them in another, and they stay the same, but they do something else as well? I mean, I mean look, if I take an egg out of the fridge and put it in a pot on the stove, it's still an egg. And then... I might light the fire under the pot, and it becomes a hot egg instead of a cold egg, but it's still an egg. And then it changes its consistency, and it becomes a hard-boiled egg. Yes, and there you are. Words are like eggs. Right. But what gives me the right to take someone else's eggs? I'm sorry, words, and cook them, so to speak. I mean, I own the egg. It's mine. I can do what I like with it. There are loads of interesting things I can do with an egg. <laughs> I could try changing it into something else. Spinach, perhaps? But why would I bother? Why would I just buy spinach in the first place? It's a different process. Hens lay eggs. Spinach grows in the garden. I am here, you are there, my heart is in your keeping, and you know it not. My heart with yours is sleeping, it nestles quite unnoticed, breathes with your warm breath, sleeps a beat when you're afraid, ticks on and on and on through the day's routine. I am obliged to you for the pacing and the racing. My heart is in your keeping, and you know it not. I'm not mad. I would to heaven I were. For then, just like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could, what should I forget? What? What? Whoa, talk about a senior moment. <laughs> There's always a reason why we forget things, isn't that right? What if I could, what? Let's try a different tack. Uh, does anyone know the scene? It's uh, King John, and Constance is talking to the Cardinal and the King. And there's preach some philosophy to make me mad, and thou shalt be canonized, Cardinal. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's that's what she says to the cardinal. What does he say back to her? 
lady you are to madness and not sorrow. Oh, thank you so much. So, <laughs> there you have it. It's sorrow that I was trying to forget. Sorrow. Oh, if I could, what sorrow should I forget? And yet, not quite. There's something about that that doesn't quite fit. Um, and I know that not just because I do actually know the line. It is in my head somewhere. I, I just can't access it at this moment. But I, I know it's not quite right because it doesn't quite scan. Because, see, if I allow the iambic pulse to beat a little more strongly, oh, if I could, what sorrow should I? Oh, all right, to be fair, we need a trochaic inversion here. Now, does everybody know what a trochaic inversion is? You weren't, I'm sure it was lecture two, <laughs> Professor Holbrook, <laughs> iambic penta, you didn't come to that one. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, you've heard of iambic pentameter. You know, that's the underlying rhythm that Shakespeare uses throughout a lot of his verse drama. And it's also apparently the underlying rhythm of the English language. So, it, and it goes da 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 da, and a trochaic is that reverse. So it goes da 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 da, etc. Okay. So, let me just try it again. Oh, if I could, what sorrow should I forget? Oh, I, I don't know about you, but I find something inappropriate—a banality creeping in with the extra syllable, no matter where I place the emphasis. Now, sorrow, is, it's close, but it doesn't quite fit. And, and I do know that, because although I can't remember the word Shakespeare chose, I remember how it made me feel. But it had more power than that. Words express how we feel, isn't that right? I'm not mad. I would to heaven I were. For then tis like I should forget myself. Oh, if I could, what grief should I forget. Of course, of course. Right. I, I wonder if one of you would help me here. I need a cardinal. Does, does anyone else know the scene? Um, would you like to say the line, Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow? Lady, you utter madness, not sorrow. Yes. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> would you like to say it? Lady, you offer madness, not sorrow. Whoa, yes. Would you like to say it? Lady, you offer madness and not sorrow. Oh, isn't it? It's just lovely stuff. And, it, and every voice brings something different to it, and it still means the same. Well, you've changed the line slightly, but I'll let you off. <laughs> 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 so, that, so but how about you? I'd love to hear you say it again. Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Oh, lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Yes. But could you say it again, only this time give it a little attitude. Tell me, a lady, that I utter this madness thing and not this sorrow thing. Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Ooh, that's telling me. Would you mind saying it again after I give you the three-word cue, our modern invocation? Sure. Sure. Come on out. This is fun. It's always fun having someone to play with. Oh, that my tongue were in the thunder's mouth! Then with a passion would I shake the world! And rouse from sleep that fell anatomy which cannot hear a lady's feeble voice, which scorns a modern invocation. Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Thou art not holy to belie me so. I am not mad. Oh, this I'm very much afraid you are. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me. Oh, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for interrupting, ladies and gentlemen. But um, I understood this is supposed to be lecture four. In the New Renaissance series. <laughs> yes, it is. And the lecturer is supposed to be the eminent author and actor, Dame June Bloom. June Bloom? Yes, I knew that. Of course, it is, and I am. What's your point, young man? Well, my point is that you're not June Bloom. Sorry? Of course, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say that? Thank you. Thank you very much for your help. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. It was very kind. Mm -hmm. This is outrageous. 
Well, it's, it's laughable, really. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams. Not well, that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he knows me. All's well that ends well yet. Though time seems so adverse and means unfit, I'm not mad. No? No. Well, told us so often enough. The lady doth protest too much, we think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, but she'll keep her word. Oh, have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in it? You are not king. You do but jest. Poison and jest. But now, don't worry, I'm, I'm not offended. No offence in it. I'm sorry, but uh, how do you know I'm not the king? My ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. S say, is my kingdom lost? My father hath the power to acquire of him. Learn to make a body of a limb. I wonder who do you think I am? You don't look anything like Dame June Bloom. You don't sound anything like Dame June Bloom. I've seen all her movies. She's much taller. She's younger than you. <laughs> well, that's about the nicest compliment I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> Enough of this hilarity. Uh, look, uh, who are you? you? You seem to know your Shakespeare very well. Tell us your name. I'm a student. My name is Jerome. Uh, who are you? Who is your father? My name is Constance. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son and he is lost. No. No, he's not. His name's not Arthur. He's not lost. You said so yourself. Well, yes, but... Uh, where is your son? No. No. No matter where. Nowhere. Indeed? No matter where, indeed. Of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves. Of works. Of epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all are Bolingbrooks, and nothing can we call our own save death. And that small model of the barren earth that serves as paste and cover to our bones. You asked what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground. Please. Our words. What? We can bequeath our words, by which I mean writers of plays bequeath us their words. Are you a writer? No. No, you're an actor. <laughs> <laughs> My father hated actors. Oh, ho, ho, ho. and so he named you after Saint Jerome, the patron saint of students. <laughs> Do you know Saint Jerome was a very clever man? He spent years doing the kind of close reading, fine analysis of the Bible, checking different versions, different translations, trying to nail down the meaning of words. In much the same way that Shakespeare scholars have been doing for the past 400 years. And it's, it's wonderful work. It's, it's marvelous. It's amazing the things they discover. Perhaps I should say rediscover, because if they're right, they're only telling us what was already known. Yes, but wouldn't you agree? Uh, we can only understand the context in which those words are written from the perspective of our own culture, our own times. Oh, what are you a student of? Well, you, you're absolutely right, of course. What I have left behind, destroyed in honour. Your son was a writer, isn't that so? You've obviously done your homework. Are you a reporter? No. <laughs> My son was a writer, like his father. My, my husband, George, used to say he was the hermit, writing stories in a cave. While I was the magician, travelling the world, creating magic. George used words to weave magical traces around ordinary lives where I have always tried to find some kind of present truth within the words. But Charlie used words to hide the truth. No, that's not fair. Your husband's last book was never published, was it? 
No. Why not? I read it. Some of it. That manuscript sat on the kitchen table for a week before I looked at it. Most of the time I forgot it was there, but there was an element of conscious procrastination. Perhaps he wanted you to read it. So had read it, his epic novel. Yes. So that he could ask me what I thought and then completely ignore anything I might say. Eventually I decided to look at a few pages while I was filling in time as I was making pancakes. I'd been listening to the radio when I was overwhelmed by a wave of guilt that I wasn't devoting this potential thinking time to a project of my own, a book of poems I was working on at the time. So I tried thinking for a few pancakes. How'd it go? All I got were prematurely turned pancakes. <laughs> Lovely colour and soggy on the inside. Not much of a cook then. So I picked up a few pages and found myself plunged into a part of my own history. So that's how it's done, I thought. You just write it as it was, changing the names as you go. Oh, well, I wouldn't put it quite like that. Yes, except that he had written me out of it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> It was a novel, it was fiction for Pete's sake. I did not exist. There was Sam, the Welshman, who was our lodger for a time, and his dodgy posh mate. And our home, he described it so well, right down to the records we pirated. And the dodgy posh mate's girlfriend, who was actually a very good friend of mine. And I fancied Sam something rotten. George never knew that. Did your son know that? Sam knew. Sam slept with every woman in the whole community, but he never made so much as a pass at me. Perhaps he was loyal. Your son must have known. My son wasn't there. He left. Left? He ran away. Perhaps I wasn't. Just not there. I did not exist. I did not fit into the plot, but I was there, and who is with me? Who can hear as I can with eyes in my ears? There is no sense in it. This is not sensible. Oh, I should be drunk to be so stupid. What price my hard one right not to judge myself? I turn it out, not in. I'm so sorry, everyone. The the lecture seems to have gone awry. I, I think we should get back to the topic. Thank you. Um, which is the voice of Shakespeare. Because the question is, with whose voice does Shakespeare speak? Well, metaphorically, of course, his own, whoever he or she was. But we are not dealing with metaphor here. We're dealing with the real, live, living Shakespeare. The one who struts his hour upon our stages in our times, telling our stories. And that can only happen if his words are being created anew in our bodies. Why? What? Well, why can't we just read them? I enjoy reading them. It makes perfect sense to me just to read it to myself. You know, I could answer that in great depth if there were time. And I, I shall in my next lecture series, which will be entitled... <laughs> Shakespeare, the voice of Australia. Do feel free to attend, you might learn something. <laughs> but now, could we, could we accept that this lecture attends to the spoken word on the assumption that Shakespeare is a playwright worthy of performance? Because it seems to me if we're going to perform Shakespeare, we're going to use his words, because what else is Shakespeare? Stories? Themes? Ideas, of course. But others have written plays based on the same stories, themes, ideas. Why do we still perform Shakespeare? Because of the words he chooses and the way he strings them together for being not mad but sensible of grief. My reasonable part produces reason how I may be delivered of these woes and, and, and teaches me to kill or hang myself. If I were mad, I should forget my son. No, I should re remember. Yes. What do you remember? Nothing. I, I remember nothing. Do you remember writing?
party. Party? Yes. Images of silence, sound, and quality taking form inside me, sliding magically down the insides of my arms, ideas falling from my fingertips as words. I remember my son. I remember making breakfast for him. His school tie askew, his blazer imploding with next year's growth. That was the year he believed me, in all honesty, to be immortal because he'd heard that I had once stepped aside hurriedly for Bernard King. <laughs> well, no one here knows who Bernard King is. Oh, really? <laughs> Someone? Oh. A lot of people. Oh. Barry Otto. Now you talk. <coughs> Bernard King is dead. Long live the king. <laughs> so is the dog. The dementedly devoted dog. Yes, the dog. That name for a famous African queen. Well, how funny you should have heard that. She was... She was actually... Her kennel name was Edwina Charlotte. My father's name was Charles Edward. Charles Edward. Really? A right royal sounding name. A bit old fashioned though, don't you think? Oh, old fashioned, is it? Uh, well, you should know. Or are you past all that? <laughs> you can't hurt me with that. Don't you know I belong to the favoured generation? You're not a baby boomer. No, better than that. When I was 12, the world was going mad for bobby socks, and teenagers were being invented. And then it was the 60s, and flower power, and you were out of the Vietnam demos, and I was in Grosvenor Square in 1968 with a tape recorder, interviewing draft dodgers for Radio Hanoi. And then it was the 70s, and the young went mad for punk or nostalgic for the 50s while we 30-somethings turned in ever-decreasing circles of self-pity and self-emolument. But by 1984, we'd got it together again with health food kicks and fitness freaks. And even made grey hair fashionable. I came home from time from tour one, one time to find Charlie and all his school friends with what, to all intents and purposes, were grey streaks in their hair. By the time I turned 50, everyone who mattered, including Jane Fonda, was there already, making it look good and sound exciting. So the world was real and you were there, you took part in it? I did, for all the world. You were married. And who was? You had a child. You must have loved your husband once. I did, I, I thought I did. I thought I knew what love was. Isn't that a song? I never knew you what must love have loved was. Your son. Charlie, did he say? No. I don't play that game, Mr. Jerome, son of Charles Edward. I lost him. He is lost. Young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. Fare you well. Had you such a loss as I, I could give better comfort than you do. Oh, I, I will not keep this form upon my head when there is such disorder in my wit. All those years, didn't you even miss him? What have I done that thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me? Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love and makes a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as dice as oh, so, oh such a deed as from the body of contraction plucks the very soul and sweet religion makes a rhapsody of words. Heaven's face doth blow. Yea, this solidity and compound mass with tristful visage as against the doom is thought sick at the act. Why would you think that? I was never unfaithful in my life. You wrote about it yourself, your own words. My You know, I remember so many words, but when we perform Shakespeare's text, it is the voice 
which provides the words that matters. I don't mean the words don't matter. The words do matter, of course they do. We must have the words. We do have them, we have them for a reason, but that's all they are, words, black marks on a white paper, or mental constructs until we voice them. Now, with whose voice does Shakespeare speak? With mine? And you say you're not mad. I'm not mad. I am my voice. Where my voice is, I am. My voice lives within me. It sounds within me and without me, but never without me. It sounds before me and behind me. And where I am, my voice is. My voice moving through time and space becomes part of you. The space of this room bends my sound voice back to me as sound gives way to silence. Is this not madness? <laughs> if I were mad, I should forget my son or madly think a babe of clouds where he. I'm not mad. Too well, too well I feel the different plague of each calamity. Do you know me? I cannot tell. Assuredly, you know me. No matter, sir, what I have heard or known. You laugh when boys or women tell their dreams. Is this not your trick? I understand not, madam. Well, then you may sit down. Oh, yes. For heaven's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. But within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his court. There the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, uh, allowing him a breath. A little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. Infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were for us impregnable. And human thus comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall. Farewell, King. Without thinking, but it's not possible. 
that said, we're not actually conscious of the words that we're going to say until they're in the act of coming out of our mouths. And if we try and say, yes, ourselves, we will stumble. Try it. Try it for yourself. Try saying something. I don't know what you had for, for breakfast or something. But you must have the conscious word that you're going to use in your mind before you say it. Say it out loud. You can stick your fingers in your ears so that you can't hear other people. And just try it and see what happens. Think the word and then say it. <laughs> do, you see, do you see how it interrupts the natural flow? You know, we just go one word and, it, and, and we stumble over it. And it, it, it. It's very tricky and the brain gets very confused when we do that because it interrupts the natural flow of the language. That's not how natural language works. Now, when an actor speaks a memorized text, she does already know the words, but in the world of the play, the character doesn't know what the words will be. So, how do we create that illusion that the character is expressing a thought rather than repeating, quoting remembered lines? Do you have another passage you could use? I'd like to extend this particular teaching point, and you do seem to have volunteered yourself as my guinea pig. <laughs> sure. Thought you might. <laughs> right. Now, while Jerome is speaking, close your eyes and see if you can distinguish just from the sound of his... I think we'll take the lights down as well. Just from the sound of his voice, whether you think you hear quoting or reciting or remembering or demonstrating or doing acting, it's another technical term we use, they're all different performative functions. Or, if you think you hear Jerome expressing the thought, or perhaps expressing the thought of the character, his, his words he's speaking. And you may choose which performative function you want to play with. About 10 lines would do. Could, could we have the lights down, please? Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the lights? Thanks. Well, what did you think? Reciting? Yes. Quoting? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's really clear in the in the quality of the voice, isn't it? Yes. Um, would anybody else like to have a go? Yes. Oh, I see a hand up the back there. Yes, come on down. Hi, what's your name? Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Yes. So, um, just about ten lines. Yeah. If it were done when it is done, then to a well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with ours, catch with this to cease success, that but this blow may be the be all and the end all here. Cool. Okay. So I can't resist. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because if you think you know, what I was saying earlier about, you know, expressing yourself. And it has to be all of you. It can't just be part of you. And this says, I'm not totally here. Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's a defense mechanism. It's a very useful defense mechanism. But when we're acting, we have to be the people who don't have defense mechanisms. Yeah? Not these ones anyway. So try it again. And soften your ankles. Soften your knees. Soften your pelvis there a little bit. Yeah? In fact, even just if you even sit down a little bit, it just it tells your body, oh, I've got to, I've got to play again, more of me, yeah? Okay, go again. If it were done when it is done, then to a well it were done quickly. If the assassination could tremble up the consequence and catch with his to see success, that but this blow may be the be-all and the end-all here. 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You know, it's such a subtle difference. But we actually heard the Tom who is Macbeth. Yeah. Because there's no there's no Macbeth without Tom. Yeah. In that moment, it's only you, and it is you, and it's really you. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Jerome, how would you like to explain to us in your words how the voice works? It's a process of transformation from me to you. Uh, my thoughts evolve, those that survive demand expression. They take all shape within my breath, inside my body. The vibrations set in motion swirl and blend and reform on their way into the room. <coughs> where you might judge them, wanting. Uh, I let them go, allow them to move freely through my skin, my bones, our shared space, your skin, your bones. Yes, very well expressed. <laughs> right, so what makes us think that giving voice to Shakespeare's words involves anything different? They're still just words, thoughts, as you said, which have taken oral shape within the speaker's body to be expressed in order to be perceived by the listeners as what? See, what I would like you to perceive are the thoughts that give rise to the sounds I shape into words. So whether the words I use are coined by me or Shakespeare, the voice I use is mine, therefore the words, in a sense, are mine. Yes, only if the thoughts that give rise to the words are yours. But I can hardly think someone else's thoughts. No, but you can think something so unreal, something so unlikely to ever be true. Sit down. You see, I dreamt I spoke with your voice. Your thoughts, unbidden and unwarranted, sprang from my mouth. My head was crammed with your dreams. Your fantasy snaked around my heart. My blood ran deep and red within your veins. Your sleep encompassed my dream. I dreamt you wished with my soul. My spirit laughed with your tears. Your sighs proclaimed my needs. My life gave up your ghost. You gave up my love. I dreamt I spoke with your voice. I spoke of dreams beyond desire. Your voice inspired desire beyond inspiration. Beyond inspiration is the sound of your voice in my dream. You wrote that poem, but it's not true. He never really existed. That man you wrote about, he's a dream lover. Of course it's not true. But if I imagine it, I think it, and then if I speak it, it has to be true. The true expression of what I'm thinking just in that moment. Do you understand? I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste, grief. Need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? Young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. You hold to heinous a respect of grief. He talks to me that never had a son. You are as fond of grief as of your child. Grief fills the room up of my absent child. Lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks repeats his words, stuffs out his vacant garment with his form, then have I reason to be fond of grief? You never cried for him. I only ever cried for him. Oh, could you be a bit more melodramatic, please? <laughs> Not without music. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the thing is, I think that's all I do. I 
read a poem, and I hear your voice, just a phrase, an echo in my mind so clear. Is this freak or obsession? I walk down Adelaide Street, and you are there, in the shop doorway, buying a book on mushrooms, looking at shirts. Is this grief? I'm not doing it consciously. You understand it happens to me. Grief, obsession, you happen to me. Okay, I get it. It's not about your husband. It's not about a lover. Is it supposed to be about your son? to be about anybody? Why can't it be a total fantasy? Why can't it be about you? You're not real. If you were real, we'd hardly be having this conversation. Not that this is a conversation. If you really existed, we, for one thing, you'd be doing all the talking, and it would be about yourself, your work, your life, your friends, your beliefs. No. That's not true. You never willingly shared those things with me. No. Are you contradicting me? Did you have the temerity to speak for yourself in my fantasy? Oh, good. <laughs> now you can talk some sense into me and then I'll be cured. It's not real. It never was real. Oh, liar. Don't tell lies. You do. I do. I have lied. I'm good at it. It's something I do well. You should know that. You are my lie. I'm real. I'm here. Too right. That's how good I am. Arrogant. Could be. But that's another lie. Are you trying to get rid of me? How can you say that? I I'm not some voice crying in the wilderness, uh, crying some prophecy of God-given vengeance. No, your voice is not a voice. It is a mind. A thought, a thought crying out of my head, the thought that batters the walls of my skull, gaining strength with each blow, and fed each day on a fearful, mindless fodder of words. Words require a mind in order to be spoken. What is a mind? What is speaking? Speaking is the act of giving voice to words. What? Ah, words. What is a voice? Voice is the body within the words. What is a body? What are words cannot express my thought? It is a monster that defies description. And so I wonder, who is with me? The history could be reenacted is irrelevant. Irrelevant? To whom? Have you forgotten my father? Oh, you, you keep saying he was lost. You don't lose a son. Is he dead? Oh, yeah. where, where is your son? Tell us the truth, at least be honest with yourself. He ran away from home 40 years ago. He went overseas, became a writer, raised a family. He never let me come anywhere near them. You obviously know this. Yes. Now, I, I don't know why. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest his common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. I am Adam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with this? Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. Precisely. It is. It must be. Just in that moment, your reality and that of the character collide, as it were. I mean, like you did just now as you're speaking those lines from Hamlet? Yes. And just then, was I supposed to be your son? Just in that moment, yes. How can you do that? How can you be so... Blatantly unfeeling. You know, I could paint if I wanted to. Real arty crafty stuff. You'd faint when you beheld my miracle. 
people would flock in their millions. They gasped. Gasped in awe. Women, the beauty. Men would grin knowingly. Full of perception, proportion. Deception, misconception. No one would even know. No one? Well, I know. I would know. How do you know that poem? That's my favourite poem from your last book. Oh, my goodness. He's actually read my poetry. Yes, I recognise quite a lot of it today. And isn't it fun how you heard it and you received it, and whether you thought it was poetry or, 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 or some self-indulgence on my part, or playing with Jerome, nothing to do with anything. You made something of it for yourself. You are so much a part Jane, of this. Can I ask you a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Do... Is it that time already? Do we have time for questions? I don't think so. I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quite think. Today has been totally out of order. We should stop now. Uh, today began with a whinge, and without, without so much as a buy your leave, it sold out. Cynical leave taking. Enough, leave it be. Should be horsewhipped. Height of damned impudence. I think I'll lock the door now. Had enough todays for today. Where is your son? Oh! Speak to me no more! These words like daggers enter in mine ears. No more! There's matters in these sighs, these profound heaves you must translate. Tis fit we understand them. Where is your son? Ah, good my lord, what have I seen tonight? What, Gertrude? How does Hamlet? Mad as the seas and wind, when both contend which is the mightier. Are you talking about yourself or your son? I'm sorry? I thought you meant questions relevant to the lecture. You keep saying he was lost. You don't lose a son. Is he dead? I was playing with text. I thought you understood that. I, is there anyone else who didn't get it? That was the whole point of the exercise after all. No, I do. I do get it. You just never cared for your son. You don't even remember him. No, 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 no. That is not how it was. My son did not remember me. Remember me? Remember me, yea, from the table of his memory, he wiped away all trivial fond records, all sores of books or forms, all precious past that youth and observation copied there. It's never enough, is it? The words inside your head scrambling for free. It's never enough, the space between the words, inviting interference. It's not enough to know, to have, to feel. There must, must be space outside my head. A clear, receptive silence. Room to maneuver. Yes, that's how it should feel. How do you know that poem? I never published it. I thought my father wrote that poem. He told it to me many years ago. No. Well, how do you know it? He didn't write it. I did. So you taught it to him then? No. It was written years after he left home. Then how could he know it? Did he have access to your private papers? Of course. Of course your father had access to everything. My son could know anything he wanted to know about me. He... Why would I keep anything hidden from him? I, I wouldn't. He needed to know. He needed to know everything about me so that he could know who he was. He thought he had nothing to do with me. He thought he existed without me. But that's as silly as saying my voice exists Without me, it's just not possible. I am my voice. I am here. Yes. And I am here. Come away, what's done cannot be undone. The sun no sooner shall the mountains touch, for we will ship him hence and this vile deed. We must with all our majesty and skill, both countenance and excuse. 
We will pass through. Green grass remembers. Hold that thought. I remember pain. Never enough of me. Who cared? Wrong question. We will pass by. Wrapped in rapture. Making flames desire arising. Strong winds fan the memories of future flights of fantasy. We jump into the blue. New. Nothing stays the same. Not, Not even memories. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Dad. The king's a beggar now. All is well ended if this suit be won, that you express content, which we will pay with strife to please you day exceeding day. Ours be your patience then, and yours our parts. Your gentle hands lend us, take our hearts. So, on, on your, your patience, patience evermore attending, new joy wait on you, here our play has ended. <laughs>